All right, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you very much for uh, staying through the whole day to our last session. Um, this session is scheduled to run until 3 o'clock. I understand if you have to leave and we're starting to run over, please just um, gather your things and, and go out as you will. We won't feel offended in any way. We understand people's time is important. Um, this session is uh, entitled An Open Forum on Knowledge Translation uh, and the Bundles Rationale. Uh, and we have two, two presenters, but essentially it's a panel discussion. Teresa Rincon is um, the nurse director of the EICU in the Sutter Sacramento region uh, and has uh, been doing quite a bit of work in severe sepsis for, I remember Teresa's name going back now, at least till 2003 we've been talking intermittently about sepsis. Uh, uh, and then having come to Sutter, I've worked much more closely with Teresa and I know how well accomplished she is in the work she does. Uh, and again, uh, Dr. Levy will join us for the panel discussion about how to translate all this science and knowledge and bundles into actual practice at the bedside at the end of her presentation and we'll have an open discussion. Uh, and so Teresa, if you're ready. Yes, I am. am I on? Okay. So knowledge translation and bundles rationale, well, this, the uh, second part, bundles rationale, you'll probably be able to understand. Some of you may not have really uh, heard of knowledge translation. Just real quick, I don't have any disclosures other than I do work for a tele-ICU or EICU <laughs> for Sutter Health, and I'm, I am paid for that, and I will talk a little bit about that. I'll also talk about some platforms that were used through Microsoft, but I have no disclosures with them. Um, the problem that we have in healthcare is pretty well defined and known by everyone, I think, in this room. The IOM six aims are to provide timely, safe, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered care. And we know that inadequate knowledge and lack of experience have been cited as major contributions of mistakes that harm patients. I don't know if some of you ever heard the statistic that uh, IOM has put out before, but Don Berwick has mentioned that the eighth leading cause of death in the United States are har is harm caused by mistakes in hospitals. So we harm patients, not meaning to, but we harm patients. And clinical knowledge-based care and evidence-based clinical decision-making need to replace the unscientific care that is being delivered in healthcare. That has been something that many of us have talked about for a long time. Uh, so what do we need to do? Here's a few of the things that we need to do. We have seen uh, massive amounts of literature and evidence to support these things that improve teamwork and collaboration are needed. We need to be able to translate evidence into something that's usable, relevant, and accessible in the, in the form of knowledge. And that's really what we're going to talk about today is how do we do that? How do we take these complex disease states and then actually translate them and diffuse that information down to the people providing the care at the bedside? And um, sometimes those are called microsystems where care is actually being delivered. Evidence-based practice, I think we all know what that is. It's defined as using the current evidence in clinical decision-making. Evidence-based knowledge management is a concept of combining knowledge management conceptual frameworks or theories with evidence-based practice. And it really gets down to how do we give the right care at the right time. That's really what it is about, simply put. So severe sepsis remains a significant cause of mortality and morbidity. We've seen some great data to suggest if we follow the evidence, we can improve that. But it's still, after uh, 10 years, we're still battling with implementing these bundles. And it's very complex disease. We've talked about that. We've talked about how difficult it is to define sometimes this disease. And then it's difficult, of course, if you can't define it, to diagnose it and then treat it, especially in a timely manner. So how do we support bedside teams with the information that they need uh, in order to provide good care? And then when they're providing the care, have that rapid feedback mechanism so that they can see whether or not they're meeting the metrics. Because we also know that we go to work every day to provide good care. I don't think most physicians or nurses go to work and say, I don't care what happens to my patients today. I think they do. They set out to do a good job. But unfortunately, what we think we're doing is not really what always happens. And so how do we fix that? Well, knowledge translation in the ICU uh, is a concept. There was an article recently by Mitchell and some of his cohorts on looking at knowledge translation and uh, in intensive care units. And just to sum it up, what I thought from reading the article was we really need new methods to oper operationalize effective evidence. So we need to do that. And 
This is a diagram that was in that article that really looks at the model of knowledge translation and knowledge use. And you can see it talks about evaluating outcomes, sustaining that knowledge, identifying problems, adapting again, um, then assessing the barriers, uh, and then tailoring your plans. And really, it, it goes to uh, knowledge acquisition or creating knowledge that might not have been there before, and then figuring out how to rapidly follow up and synthesize that information. So some of the uh, targets or in the conclusion of that article that were identified was to identify local and institutional clinical behaviors, assess and overcome barriers to integrating research into clinical practice, target interventions, and measure performance. So what I want to talk to you about today is an experience that we had at Sutter Health in which we created a process and a tool to screen and identify patients for severe sepsis from a virtual remote environment and then collect data on compliance to the bundles. It's not a perfect process. I'm the first one to tell you that, but we have been able to generate new knowledge in order to look at how we can improve and how we can do even better. So the first article has been published in uh, 2011 in Telemedicine and Health. Coming soon is an article, Integration of Evidence-Based Knowledge Management in Microsystems, and it talks about this experience. So I'm going to give you a preview of that article that's due out in Critical Care Nurse Quarterly this fall. So this is what we basically did. We took the EICU and we could take a small cohort of board-certified intensivists and critical care nurses with experience of at least five years in critical care. On average, they have 15 to 20. We have about 76%, 75% of the nurses in the Sacramento Hub now have their CCRN. We're, uh, our goal for this year was 75% with a stretch goal of 100. In the Bay Area, they're uh, targeting that goal as well. So we can take this one small group and get them highly trained on the bundle requirements, the definition, how to screen and identify. I've heard from you all, and we've experienced at Sutter, how difficult it is to get everybody educated on how to screen. Just screening itself is a massive undertaking. So what about taking a small group and making them experts in screening? You can make sure that also with data collection, you can improve the inter-rater reliability problems you have when you have multiple hospitals all trying to collect data using their own set of definitions and, and guidelines. And so this was our hope, is we, whether or not we could do this. So we built a form in 2005, and we piloted it, and we used an InfoPath platform with SharePoint. And so we could turn this into what's called an open source document. And in this document, we could collect discrete data elements. Um, we were able to create knowledge from this. In fact, we were able to help Philips VisiQ, and I don't get any money from them either. Um, we were able to help them create a sepsis prompt that now fires. It looks at every patient monitored, and we monitor over 400 adult critical care beds in Northern California from the two hubs. It looks at every single critically ill patient every two hours, and it will fire a prompt. And it's based on looking at logistical regression and a support vector machine, which is similar to uh, the analysis that logistical regression does, to add um, weights to the different variables um, of criteria for SIRS, infection process, and organ failure to determine whether or not this patient meets criteria for severe sepsis. Uh, we are able to engage then in real time as well as after the fact bedside champions and provide them back information on everything from incidents to compliance to the bundle. And we believe that this has had a positive impact on the outcomes. It's not that we did it by ourselves. We've done it in collaboration with the bedside teams who are actually executing the care. We are there as an additional set of eyes and providing an additional resource. Um, this is what the prompt looks like. Uh, we have this checklist to care just to show you. Um, this is our data. This is Apache risk-adjusted data. This is Apache 3 in 2004, and then in 2008, we went to Apache 4. Uh, this is uh, all-cause mortality for four of the hospitals in the Saxera region. One of them was Sutter Roseville, which Marianne talked about and, and showed the sepsis decrease in data. And this is O to E ratios, so observed to expected mortality. And you can see that in... Um, uh, 2004, we were almost to the top of, the, of what would be a confidence interval uh, line, and then over time went down. That is a greater than a six standard deviation difference in uh, reduction in all-cause mortality, and we believe that 
the targeting of sepsis at those four hospitals early on, which started in 2005, 2006, is one of the reasons why all-cause mortality also dropped. Marianne alluded to that as well in her presentation. And then I think if we looked at length of stay, Marianne did a, a wonderful job of talking about what they felt was the financial impact at one hospital for decrease in length of stay for sepsis alone. You can see that for all-cause mortality at those same four hospitals, there's been a st statistically significant reduction in length of stay. So, you know, I really believe that you can use uh, many different ways and avenues. Uh, I'm not here to advocate that the tele-ICU experience is the only way to crack this nut, but I am here to say that we have to look at innovative ways to uh, determine how we improve care. This I found in uh, Harper's Weekly Motor Efficiency Service uh, in 1917, and it was an analysis on the cost and benefits between horses and tractors. And they actually looked at how much a horse eats and, and how many horses are needed to do the same work as one tractor. And I think it's kind of funny back then that they had to set the stage for why you would want to use a tractor on a farm instead of a horse. But maybe we need to think a little bit more creatively as critical care clinicians on how do we use some of the infrastructures and technologies that we have available today to leverage expertise across broader geographical areas and into even community hospitals in large cities that do not have the same resources as we might have at academic centers or large tertiary care centers. So just something, a little food for thought. And then now, I talked fast so we could get to the point of having questions. This is the rationale discussion for the bundle, uh, the new bundle revisions, and then a charge to you, how will you translate knowledge in your organization based on the revisions of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Bundle? Mitchell? <laughs> I was thinking like it'd be intensivist versus tele ICU. <laughs> How much do intensivists eat, you know? Um, I, so I, I, I'm not going to talk, fortunately, but I am going to just put up the um, bundles slide, if I can find it, so that we have something for discussion. So this is the, um, I wish I could put these both up, but I can't. So the two bundles, I think some of you know this, these are the two, two new bundles. We've dropped the management bundle um, for obvious reasons, uh, which is of all the four elements, uh, there's, there's none that really are pertinent anymore, and I'm making a long story short. So this is the new bundle, two bundles, uh, an immediate bundle, which is this bundle, the sepsis resuscitation bundle, to be done immediately but by the end of three hours. It's really important. This bundle is meant to be, as soon as you see a patient with severe sepsis or septic shock, you should do this. It's not meant take three hours to get this done. So immediately you should measure a serum lactate, get blood cultures, give antibiotics, and give 30 cc's per kilogram of fluids, crystalloid. And it should be immediate. Because many of us know in our institutions, at the end of three hours, there are four liters in, rather than just two, this would be two liters. And that's the first bundle. And the second bundle is the septic shock bundle, which should be done within six hours, which is if the patient's still hypotensive, they get a central line because you're going to give vasopressors, and you're going to measure a CVP and an SCVO2 and get them to 8 and 70% respectively. And that's it. These are the measures to end that have been submitted to the National Quality Forum as sepsis measures uh, to be reviewed sometime this or next month. So I will leave that up. And so I, I think as a, um, as a transition point for our discussion from Teresa's slide to these bundles, slides to these bundles, uh, and the topic of the, of the presentation is knowledge translation. And if you think about it for a moment, the whole, the whole purpose of the bundles, are, they're tools. They are knowledge translation tools to take the knowledge that's in the guidelines and translate them into practice at the bedside. Uh, and so they're just one of the tools that are available that we've tried to make available to clinicians to influence behavior. Um, the mechanisms that Teresa talked about and the paper that uh, Mitchell had just published with Krista and um, Dr. Black included um, um, also mechanisms of knowledge translation and discussed um, how it is that we go from point A to point B in the way that we care for patients. And so the question I want to ask all of you to, to, to open up the discussion a bit is, 
We all understand audit and feedback is important. Um, it, it's clear from some of the slides that you've seen today that, um, that Sutter Health has been able to disseminate through their EICUs a, a lot of information. They have an, a, a, a natural built-in place to make that happen. I want to ask those of you in the audience to share with us, if you would, how it is that you share information amongst your facilities if you're from a health system or if you're just a standalone hospital doing this work on your own without the benefit of a larger system approach, how it is that you're able to get data out to your team and how often and what the barriers are to making that happen. Um, and so those are the kinds of questions I wanna focus this on if people can start thinking in those directions. I'm sure other health systems, I know Kaiser has an approach, I, I'm not sure what Dignity's approach is, but I'd like to know uh, what strategies have been used. And so, if you think about that question, that would be good to start. <laughs> it's getting late. No, but it, it's, we can rely on Brenda for a question, so that's always good. Sorry. No, from Dignity Health standpoint, how we disseminate our information to our, we have 36 hospitals now, I think, in our system. So we have a sepsis report card. And what we do is we collect data that's inputted into a MIDAS program and um, we disseminate it as a report card every month. So it, it shows them their mortality rate, their cost savings, as well as bundle compliance. And, and that, that uh, ostensibly, uh, that report card is then sent out to the clinicians or to the nurses or to it's the quality department? It's sent out to the um, hospital administrative personnel as well as the sepsis lead at each facility. Each facility has a sepsis lead. And so, and it goes to their team as well as the administration. And do you, would you feel, Brenda, that that information is um, timely enough to act on a next cycle of change to be able to alter? Is it, are you receiving information optimally yeah, to make it, a change? It, no, and I think it's a little behind because what we do is we have a pull list that we, we pull data a month and a half after the fact they have a few weeks to do chart abstraction and then put it back into the system. And then, so it's probably almost a month and a half, two months behind. We have the same problem at Sutter. Our, yeah. Most of our data is, re, is retrospective. It's it would be great to do level. more concurrent, but I don't know that it's feasible. Yeah, very difficult. People mm -hmm. at IHI would say this is a no-no. Right. Uh, um, you know, the, right. The, the lack of real-time data and feedback of that data doesn't allow the good information to come in to make a next test of change and to move forward rapidly. Um, and so my training would argue against this. On the other hand, to, it's, impossible. it's impossible to collect data on a large population like this, especially across the healthcare system, without right. some retrospective review. So the sepsis campaign and our approach when we developed our database was to um, although it was a simple database, it, it actually would feed back information in real time at the push of a button. So you could get run charts on how your performance was, and that was done intentionally to allow people to make changes at the bedside. So yet another example of a tool. Right. And Mary Ann may be going to talk about this, so I might steal her thunder a little bit, but I, uh, we worked collaboratively with the uh, Moore grant in the Sacs Hair region to improve our communication between the sites because we had started sepsis identification, as I said, in 2005, and we didn't get the grant until years later. But Mary Ann was instrumental in working with and developing a process uh, with collaboration with the Saxera hospitals to do real, very close to real time. So as soon as every patient who's discharged from the hospital the prior week, the data is sent to a sepsis champion at the hospital that shows exactly uh, what the EICU was able to gather information on. Sometimes we can't gather all the information for various reasons. Uh, a lot of the sites still document on paper, so it's very difficult in real time to see what's happened, but it allows them to quickly look at the patients that screened positive the prior week and then uh, pull the chart themselves and they are all trained in the data definitions and look at whether or not there really is an opportunity for improvement or if there's an opportunity to improve how we're collecting the data because we did, did have problems with that. So I'm gonna let Marianne address that from her perspective, but she was instrumental in designing that process. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for letting me jump ahead. Um, so yeah, to, to piggyback onto that, 
one thing that happened was instead of having folks doing chart reviews constantly and sending the data back to the EICU to be revised and then a report was created and then it took, you know, two to three months to get this out. The second thing that happened as a result of, well, many things happened as a result. One was when we had data coordinators at each affiliate, they were just more engaged in what their data looked like and they were more engaged in the process. So instead of having a report come to them and they just complain that they didn't believe the data, they were actually um, responsible for validating and revising the data. So then when they got it back, it was more believable to them. The other thing they were able to do, and mostly because of the resources provided from our MORE grant, I want to give a shout out to my data analyst, Rebecca Petrella, but where we were waiting two, three, and four months for getting uh, bundle compliance and mortality data from the system, we actually download the data on the 19th of the end of the previous month. So for this month, July, we will, we will download uh, the date, or last month, we'll download the data on the 19th. The reports are actually available on the 20th of the following month, and they're posted on a website where everyone can just go and download them. So that's about as, in, in addition to the weekly OFIs where folks are looking at their cases week by week, in terms of reports and things that you can download, print, and bring to a meeting, uh, they're readily available before the end of the next month, which is the quickest turnaround time I've seen in, in, in around. So that was mostly through the resources provided from the Moore Foundation that we were able to do that. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Karen. I am the director of ICU at Sequoia, which is also a Dignity Health Hospital. I wanted to tag on the back of Brenda and her conversation about how we relay the information to clinicians. So I am the sepsis team lead at my hospital. I share that information when I get it with the RNs and MDs and the respiratory therapists because they are so integral in how we deal with all of this. When we have a patient who's admitted to the ICU from the ED and we've seen that there is an issue, all clinicians um, involved in that situation are given, you know, feedback, whether it's a, hey, great, you guys are 100% on everything. This is awesome. Want to let you know that that patient who looked like they were going to die yesterday is actually sitting up eating breakfast, mm -hmm. and you guys need to know that. And the other part that we share, though, is when there's a difficult case where elements fell out and there's areas for improvement, we share that with all the players and then use it. I use it in my ICU as part of my unit huddle of how these cases fell out and how we can improve in this area, things to be aware of. Right. And, I mean, I would argue that you're, you're doing the knowledge translation then. Um, all these larger features and bigger systems and conglomerations of ICD-9 codes and shrinkage of data and crunching and so forth has nothing to do with, with the huddling of clinicians at the bedside to talk about the case that they just resuscitated or um, what their failures were in the previous attempt to resuscitate. It's, it, that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck is if you can get people together after the case um, to talk about it. And that, I don't say that as if that's mastered in my own institution. That's not, a, that's still a challenge for us. Hi again, Ian Nguyen, UC Davis. Um, we, we're still very much a work in progress, but we've tried to get towards real time. So one issue was real time, the other issue was that knowledge translation you talked about. In terms of real time for us, we've leveraged our electronic health record to try to get real time data, identify patients clinically, so not waiting until discharge um, for some kind of IC or DRG diagnosis of um, sepsis. So we use the electronic health record that identifies SERS criteria. We prompt an alert, <laughs> ask the clinicians, is this due to infection or not? Um, in order to get into our cohort, they either have to have hypotension, uh, they have to have elevated lactic acid, or the physician has initiated a severe sepsis order set, which we've gone through great lengths to try to educate our physicians to use this pathway, which has all the elements incorporated in it uh, to be compliant with the bundle. Um, so if the physician believes that they meet criteria for other reasons besides hypotension or, or elevated lactic acid, they get into our cohort. And of course, we're able to measure the bundle through some um, uh, automated mechanisms through our electronic health record. So. That's the real-time piece, and we're in the process of getting that data out to our clinicians basically on a weekly basis. On the knowledge translation piece, we've done a lot of work on nurse training. So we've um, uh, started a course on 
uh, for nurses primarily, but now we're getting some physicians going to the course as well, but how to identify those patients utilizing um, sort of what's, what's in existence in our electronic health record and how to recognize those patients better, um, utilizing some examples, real world examples of what we've seen in the hospital and trying to talk through those issues and better communicate amongst each other. So, still very much a work in progress though. I throw it back to others on the panel to discuss this question, but you, you know, you've, you've talked about, it sounds like you've got a, um, one foot in the electronic world to gather information and another to actually do something with the nurses to actually begin to affect the change that you want. And that sounds like a good middle point to be. Have you heard of health systems that have been very successful with, uh, with going from we have data, we have lots of data, too much data, to, to making this cultural transformation to being able to actually have these huddles at the bedside where change is measured closely? I'm, and there may be some people in the room that have had this experience as well. Um, but I find it to be the most daunting challenge in, at, in this work. Uh, anybody comment on their experience at their hospital or the state of? Well, I think um, one of the problems that we have is that we are using uh, fairly archaic methods of educating, um, lecture-based education. This is a better platform because at least there's panels, so we're having interaction. But lecture-based education is known to not work. You're only going to retain about 50% of what you hear on average. So that means some people are only retaining 25% and maybe a few at 75%, most people in the middle. So trying to do these lecture formats don't work. I know one thing that worked well in the Saxera region was the simulation, bringing simulation around. But that's a very expensive method as well. And some hospitals are not going to be able to afford bringing simulation or sending people to simulation. Another platform that is emerging right now is virtual simulation. And that is where you can assign not an e-learning environment, but an actual interactive web-based environment where you go into a patient's room and you solve clinical case studies in a patient's room where you can pull up the vital sign data, the hemodynamic data. Uh, you can look at the ventilator. You can try to talk to the patient if you can. Uh, these are platforms that I think are where we need to go in the future when it comes to educating people. The second piece is even after you've educated someone, how do you provide knowledge at the moment that they need it? That's a big problem. How do we get knowledge at the point that you need it? Because if I teach you something and then you don't do it for six months, you're likely to forget some things. And if you don't see a disease state very often, you're likely to not be able to uh, maintain proficiency. So these are other things that I think we need to start looking at technology to help us support. If we have an electronic health record and you haven't taken care of an ARDS patient in six months, it should automatically cue you into a very short tutorial on ARDS and on ventilation management. There's no reason why we can't create that. If a nurse hasn't given an uh, epidural injection for pain management in a long time, the Pixis machine should be able to pop up and give them a short tutorial on how to safely provide an epidural in in injection. These technologies are, are there, we just haven't figured out in healthcare how to use them. Question here. Hi, my name is Kim. I'm from Sutter Delta. I'm one of the sepsis champions for our hospital. And um, in working with Tom Sugarman, uh, we developed a spreadsheet where we actually take the information that's been given to us every month and review the charts. I review from a nursing standpoint, then he reviews us from a doctor standpoint. We go back one to one to the people who have had opportunities for improvement to implement um, in some education. And then I've extrapolated upon that and I've actually gone and taken charts and completely rewritten them in my handwriting, taken the patient's name off of them, the nurse's name off of them, and the doctor's name off of them, and made poster boards with questions mm -hmm. to improve critical thinking amongst the nurses. And we've put these poster boards up for a month at a time and we've had spots ask questions, come to me, talk to me, we'll walk you through it. And you see sometimes well, actually, I would say 99% of the time, I saw the aha light go on in many nurses' eyes. It was really a, a really good opportunity, and I think that that's what we're going to try to do now, is instead of doing that just in the emergency room, we're going to actually try to take that to the floors and um, do something along those lines as well with a specific chart, take all identifying information off of it and do that. And it was uh, very good with the spreadsheet. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. The spreadsheet that Tom 
um, and how I helped make. I actually take the medical records numbers off of those and the names off of those, but if they've expired, I have it in bold letters. And when they start seeing how many of these patients have expired, then their alertness and their um, hypervigilance towards these patients has improved. Yeah, in, even in the back of my head, I, there's a voice that's asking me to ask the question, which I know nobody will answer, but I'll, I'll just put it out there rhetorically. I'd like, I guess I want to ask the question, is there anybody that's having no feedback of data and, and what their experience with that is like, uh, with the difficulty? And I'm sure there are people who are having difficulty getting data back to the front lines. Um, I don't know if anybody here is brave enough to speak to that if that's happening, but you can imagine that there are, I've been to hospital systems where that is the key problem um, and something to think about. So I think we're, uh, we've pretty much petered out the questions in, on this topic, but I, I think the, the key take home messages for knowledge translation are lots of different tools to do it, lots of ways to present data, bundles to apply, uh, real time data feedback, huddling of groups at this bedside when possible after successful resuscitation to review actual real-time data is probably the best thing that can happen. But there's also an advantage to systemic data that we can get uh, even with delays to analyze our trends over time. And certainly many of the graphs that have been shown here today show us nice trends and improvement over time. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attention coming to our uh, improvement and implementation update. And I hope you have a good remainder of your day and drive home safely. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody.